Let's Talk Native is produced at the Eltian Studios on the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. We break all the rules for Native media by peeling back the layers of assimilation and indoctrination. No prayers, no buffalo speeches, and no spirituality shows. While this podcast does not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do take a tough look at history, oppression, and our survival. But the real goal here is to bring our people together by breaking down what separates us. So, welcome to Let's Talk Native with John Kane. Hey everyone, welcome to Let's Talk Native. I'm John Kane, your host. And uh, look, I want to get right into it. Our existence. You know, I, I've talked a lot about identity and I've talked a lot about... Um, uh, about surviving, we're still here, and that kind of thing. But it wasn't necessarily the plan that we would be here. And when I say that, I don't mean it just that it was that it was the plan of our oppressors that we would be eliminated. If you look at our history, and and of course, our histories don't all line up exactly. You know what Native people in uh, on the east coast of of Turtle Island experienced was at, at a different time than what you know our, our brothers and sisters on the west coast or, uh, of Turtle Island experience. So we all had different time periods that we interacted with uh, with colonization, with, uh, with conflict. But I guess you know, part of what I wanted to, wanted to talk about today is understanding that not only was was the plan to eliminate us in terms of you know whether it was from from murder or uh, you know massacres, war, you know pestilence, um, even even residential schools and some of the assimilation programs. Understanding that those were not just gifts. The idea that they thought they were going to educate us to, to to make us better people. No, it was about making us conform. And I want to talk about that because at a at a significant level. Our families, our ancestors, were complicit with that conformity, and and I, and I'm not saying it to condemn them. Look, I think if you look at at the history of many peoples, you are going to see what a people uh, will do to to survive. And you know, when I look at, you know, even you know, frankly, in, in my lifetime, or, or certainly only a generation before, we know that our families went along. You know, they, they went along with things like, well, for instance, residential schools. I mean, uh, uh, we're doing this program from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation, the Thomas Indian Schools right here on, on territory. That didn't happen because it was, in, it was forced or imposed upon the people here. There were people here that were complicit with that. And in fact, many of the residential schools you know, that exist on native territory had a certain amount of support within the community. And if you look at where previous generations had gone, in terms of indoctrination and assimilation, whether it was joining the church or a church, the, the Catholic church, the, the Methodist church, the Baptist church, the Presbyterian church, the Mormon church. These were all examples of our people going along with what was coming onto our territory. Enlistment in the armed forces. I've talked a lot about that. I'm not going to belabor the point, but the idea that our people had, were, had become so complicit with the military industrial complex of the United States you know, even before it had that name, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about Native people who participated in in the Civil War, Native Native people who participated in the Spanish American War, in, in in World War One, in World War Two, Korea, Vietnam. This was all wasn't all a result of of the draft. Native people were enlisting at a very at the highest rates of any other people in the uh, in the United States, and part of that, you know, people will oftentimes jump and say, "Well, that's because we of our warrior culture." Well. I don't know. I don't know. I think some of it is was out of the, you know, frankly, out of, out of destitution, out of being uh, impoverished. But others, other parts of it was was about trying to to earn their way uh, uh, in in gaining acceptance by the United States. Some of the earliest pushes for Native people to become U.S. citizens were came from those who had served in in the U.S. military. They felt like it should have been that should have been the the trade. I, I served in your military. I should be able, be able to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, 
Now, that wasn't a widespread necessarily, uh, a widespread uh, sentiment that all Native people wanted to become U.S. citizens. But in 1924, when the United States passed the, the Indian Citizenship Act, there wasn't major pushback. There was pushback, but there wasn't major pushback. And in fact, today, you will still hear many people say, well, we didn't get to be U.S. citizens until 1924. Rather than understanding what took place in 1924 wasn't a gift, it was, a, it was an imposition. But how do we meet that imposition? And, and, I, and I guess that's what I want to talk about, because at some point, we went from a, from a people who were, who were gradually accepting this, again, this assimilation. You know, yes, much of it was imposed upon us, but we, we allowed it. We allowed it, uh, you know, to the extent, like I said, residential schools in our territories, churches on all of our territories, army recruiters coming into our, into our communities. These are all examples of how complicit we were. The acceptance of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in many of our territories. The, the, the fact is, in 1934, when they passed the Indian Reorganization Act, many Native territories abandoned their traditional governments. And, and adopted governments that the Bureau of Indian Affairs would draft up for them. They would, they, would, they would draw up a new constitution, a new form of government, and the BIA would be a part of that government. That's, that's the level of, of acceptance that we had. Now, did we have no choice in the matter? Mm, maybe it did seem like our choices were limited. And maybe that was part of the reason to go along. And, and again, I want to be clear. I'm not condemning my parents or my grandparents or, or any of that. I'm, I'm just stating it as a matter of fact, is that we had a generation or two that became so complicit in assimilation that our language was, was almost eliminated. We, we had a generation, my father's generation, all spoke Gonyogeha. They all spoke it. But none of my cousin's generation, me or my cousin's generation, um, were, were taught the language by, by our parents. None of us were. That was, a, that was a decision. It wasn't an oversight. And, and so what was the basis of that decision? Well, part of the basis of the decision was, was, was our parents and our grandparents thinking, are we being served well by that? Are, do we have to accept our lot in life? That, that the, the old ways are no longer going to serve us. So we have to you know, chart our path in, in, in a new direction. We need to accept you know, a certain amount of this imposition of Americanism or Canadianism or, or whatever. And, and I, think that, I think that's safe to say. I think it's a safe bet to suggest that that was the case. Now, it's not to say that we didn't always maintain some level of, uh, of distinction. Part of it we couldn't get away from. Look, we had, a, we had entire generations who, who English was not only a second language, but a, but a, a weak second language. I, we hear stories, sometimes they're even comical, about from my grandparents' generation where the English was so bad that our, our people struggled to pretend they were speaking English even when they weren't. So there, there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of challenge. So they would dress the part. They'd wear their work clothes like every other working stiff out there and, not, and try not to let on that they, that they didn't understand the language. And... It's that mentality that, that suggested to that generation and, and the next generation that teaching this generation the language was probably a handicap. So, and, and, and I tell you, with, with, with that language, a huge part of our culture disappears. Luckily, enough people did maintain that language. I'll talk about something else, and I've mentioned this before on the program. I've seen pictures of Native people Haudenosaunee people, Haudenosaunee people with Plains Indian headdresses on from the 50s and the 60s. Even when, when the Six Nations went to Washington to, do, to formally declare war against the Axis powers for World War II so there could be a better justification for Native people uh, participating in, uh, you know, in the U.S. military, they went there wearing, wearing these long flowing headdresses. That wasn't our culture. So, so why was that? Well, and, and the answer is simple. Our identity was already being defined by white people. So whether it was through Hollywood or, you know, or whatever, you know, however we were being um, uh, illustrated by, by white people, we were living up to that identity. Now, 
So how do we go from that period of time in the, in the 50s and the 60s to understanding or to having a whole different understanding about who we are now? Well, and, and, I, and I have to give a, a tremendous amount of credit to the people, to our people, who were a part of what sometimes is called the sovereignty movement of the 70s. And, you know, and out of that came AIM. And, you know, for better or worse, out of that came AIM. Uh, the warrior society movements that uh, that, that came out of that. Um, there, and I think about the the Native Hawaiians who finally started push, giving some pushback to this notion that their lands were were legally annexed by the United States. So out of the sovereignty movement, which 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 kind of coincides with the civil rights movement, and you know, and and again, a lot more. Um, what I would say, liberal thinking, you know, the, the hippie movements and, and a lot of that stuff. Right in, in, in the midst of a lot of that were Native people who were making a real point to understand some of the injustices that were done. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those injustices. But, but that period of time in the 70s, when the sovereignty movement became, you know, really embedded at a grassroots level with a, with a younger generation. And, and in fact, some of the older generation... Some of them were supportive, but but much of that older generation just thought that the direction that these young people were going in was going to do nothing but bring, bring problems to our territories. Now, keep in mind, in the 70s, we were already living lives where we depended primarily on work outside of our territories. We Our territories had, had really become the place that we, that we slept and we played, but all the work was off our territories. We had almost no employment on our territories you know, other than, you know, certain small parts of, of, of a service industry and, you know, small mom and pops kind of thing. But, but we, didn't, we, we, we didn't have major employment in our territories. We, we had to go off. And, and the, uh, my father's generation uh, that were, became the high steel workers, the iron workers, the, the bridge men and all that stuff, that was all born out of the need for our people to have an economy. So our economy became based on our men leaving our homes, leaving our communities weeks at a, for weeks at a time to earn a, you know, a, a pretty lucrative income, you know, a, a quite gainful employment. But in doing so, they oftentimes had to maintain you know, a place in the city and then a, and a place back home. And our homes... Became, started to become resemble all of the homes off our territories. As we as we brought in the money from the outside, we brought in the influences from the outside. So this is what we saw that that came out of the 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 fifties and the sixties and it, and in the, and into the seventies. But at some point, both with the anti war movement, you know, coming out of out of Vietnam, uh, civil rights movement, we had a generation of young men who said no, no. We uh, we need to fight for to maintain our distinction. That was a that was a change, and and I know as we see here today, that may seem that, that may seem hard to believe. It may seem hard to believe that there was a period of time that that we actually had to have a a line drawn in the sand to say, no, we aren't going to become the white man. And but but it tangibly and 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 literally happened. And out of the 70s came the warrior societies, came the sovereignty movement, came the effort to educate ourselves. Next thing you know, we, we understood what a gestoa was, what we understood what the horns, uh, you know, uh, meant. We weren't, we, we weren't adorning chiefs with these Plains Indian headdresses. We weren't just, you know, uh, you know uh, piling on the buckskin so we could live up to somebody else's expectation about what a Native person was. We... You know, look, we, we still did the beads and we still did a lot of those other things, beadwork and, and uh, carvings and that kind of stuff. We, we still did a lot of that. But, but just as previous generations had hung on to some semblance of their identity, we started to see an entire generation. And that generation is, it's not my generation. It's, 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 it's those older than me. And I want, don't want to say it's my father's generation, but the generation between me and my father, put it that way. So the guys who are in their in the, who, who today are in their seventies and and or maybe even in, into their eighties, there there are many notable people. I mean, Vine Deloria comes to mind. Uh, you know, there there are native uh, leadership. Some of them are, some of them have gone. Some of them, you know, were, were were great educators in the beginning, but they too backed away. 
when when the when the sovereignty movement turned into more of the warrior society movement, there were a lot of people who who felt like they had, they had to take a step back. But it didn't stop us. We we had men like Louis Hall and and others who who kept you know who kept at us and said no, it, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. I mean, let's back up, back up a little bit here. We had a period of time where the St. Lawrence Seaway was literally carved through, through Mohawk territory. We had the, the New York State Thruway carved through Seneca territory. We had pipelines literally that were going through all of our territories. Today, when we think about a pipeline coming, coming through our territories, we know we're going to resist it. We're, we're going to resist that pipeline. And in fact, we're going to fight pipelines that are even near our territory. But back in the day, look, there are people, and I'm not, and again, I want to be careful. I don't want to write a blank check of hate to uh, to the people who approve these things. I, you know, I've heard some of the conversations associated with the, with the New York State Thruway, and there was a genuine fear that uh, that Native leadership had and Native people had that if they didn't go along with allowing New York State to put a thruway through there, that they would somehow be terminated, and that that New York State would just take over. They would they would overwhelm our territories. So a deal gets made. A deal that, and and we're still dealing with the consequences of, of the deal that was made over the New York State Thruway here. We still, you know, our territories are still dealing with with the railroad tracks that go through our territories, with the power lines that go through our territories, with the with the with the seaways and the uh, and the highways and, and and all of that stuff. And the level of compensation or or some you know some reparation for the damages done by those things was never even a consequence. In fact, I, re I recall seeing some of the notations and, and some of the, uh, the accounts of what happened when New York State put the thruway through Seneca territory that, that those white men pre pretty much laughed at the Senecas. They said, yeah, they wanted, a, they wanted this much and, and they wanted a cut of, of tolls and we just told them no. And, and they, they were, these white men literally laughed at the idea that they were able to have their way so easily with, with Seneca leadership. But that was then. That's not now. Now we fight a pipeline going through our territories. Now we, we fight the, through, uh, the, the easements through our territories. We, we, you know, we're prepared to stand up to the, the, the battles over jurisdiction, you know, the battles over, you know, you know, over police presence. And in fact, we built entire economies since the 70s, mind you, <clears throat> entire economies based on exploiting the regulatory advantages we have by pushing back against the state. That was unheard of before that. Look, th there, were, there was coming a time where, where, where native, even native craftsmen and artisans were afraid that they were going to have to pay sales tax on, on the products that they made. Well, we put, a, we put an end to that conversation. In fact, we started selling products, the, the most highly taxed products in, uh, in the state or the province or, you know, or whatever, whether it was tobacco, whether it was gasoline, without tax on it. And how and why did we do that? Well, we did it because we began to, to, to study. We be, began to understand that, that the state does have legal limits to their authority that they could, they, they could impose upon us. The federal government has legal limits to the authority that they, they can impose upon us. We knew that the laws that they were trying to apply to, uh, uh, to us, against us, didn't apply. And that they had no legal foundation to it. So we had to understand that stuff. So out of the 70s, it wasn't just a pushback. It wasn't just resistance. It was education. I, I think we all sometimes, we all need to think about this. We all need to know that there, even today, as we expand some of our economic development, our territories, we need to understand that we do owe a certain debt of gratitude to those that came before us. Who, who began to lay this foundation, who said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to sell tobacco out of a trunk of a car on, on native territory. And what's going to be my right to do it? Well, we're going to, we're going to fight for it. And, and I mean literally fight for it. You know, I knew, I knew people who were selling, selling tax, you know, tax-free cigarettes out of the back of a car with a, with a baseball bat. <laughs> so, so out of that has turned into you know, billions of dollars worth of, of revenue to our territories. We not only, you know, develop 
you know, more than just trunk, uh, selling cigarettes out of the trunk of a car, but we went from that to tar paper shacks to, to full-fledged convenience stores with gas stations, and with, with gas pumps. And we became uh, um, the resellers of, of products that, that came to our territories and we wouldn't pay or charge taxes for any of it. We asserted our regulatory advantages when it came to New York state tax. We asserted our authority to regulatory advantages when it came to what we, you know, how we were going to be able to build these businesses without New York state's uh, input or without the federal government telling us what we could and couldn't do. We, we went from these retail establishments to manufacturing, to manufacturing, you know, tobacco products, to manufacturing, you know, um, you know, construction companies, you know, building, uh, building more and more of, of the, uh, the infrastructure that ourselves uh, for our territories. That didn't come as a gift from the state. That didn't come as a gift. This, this wasn't a treaty guarantee or a treaty promise. These were, these were issues that we pushed forward. So when I think about our existence today, you know, again, I, I've got to re, re, <laughs> restate it. It wasn't a plan that we would still be here. And, you know, for me, 1970s doesn't seem like a terribly long time away, but, you know, I've got, you know, two more generations of canes that came since then. You know, most of the people that, that we interact with today Look, I'm, I'm becoming more of a senior statesman today. I'm in my 60s. So when I look at these, these 30-year-olds, these 40-year-olds, these 20-year-olds, they weren't even around when we were doing this stuff in the 70s. And a lot of their future is dependent on the things that we, you know, is built on the things that we did in the past. So our existence today as Native people, look, and I understand you know, I, I did a previous show where I talked about the, 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 you know, how we exist today in a full spectrum of, you know, people from, you know, again, from those who will, will fight a pipeline or a rail line or, or uh, the encroachment of land to those who, you know, who embrace, you know, a little bit more of a, of an American ideal there, whether it's through band councils or tribal councils and, and, you know, this, the sense that they need to somehow parallel everything that, that the non-native person does. Look, that's the range, but even those people will not totally, you know, you know, for, you know, forego their identity. So we, we live at a time now where we do have some choices within this, again, within this sense of identity about being native, where do we, where do we stand? But we owe the very idea that our language has been preserved, this notion of sovereignty and autonomy has been preserved. We owe that to, to the folks in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s who stood the line. And I, and I mean literally stood the line. I'm talking about conflict with police, conflict with politicians, with governors, with presidents. We went through all of that. Not everybody is, is that familiar with what, what we went through. And we still go through it. We're still at conflicts with, with New York State over gaming revenue. We're still in conflicts with, with the, you know, state and federal governments over taxation. We're still in conflicts with state and federal governments over land use and land rights. And we're still in conflict over environmental issues. But the fact that we are willing to stand up is born out of a relatively recent history of that resistance. One that only really only goes back to about the, about the 70s. I'm not saying that there weren't educated people before then. I'm not suggesting that there weren't people who spoke, who, who spoke some really good words before then. But in, as far as a grassroots movement, as, a, as far as more and more people understanding what identity meant and what, what being distinct and autonomous meant, that's, that's a relatively recent phenomenon. And, and again... If you looked, if you charted history from you know, the, the turn of the century, from you know the 20th century, we were on a steady path, a steady path towards assimilation. And yes, we, we you know there, there was land loss, but even in the absence of land loss, and I've talked about this before, we don't have to necessarily lose land to to lose distinction, and and we still are oftentimes challenged with this notion that. In order to, to move forward, we've got to adopt a policy or practice like the outside. How do we educate our children? How do we protect our children? 
How do we secure our, our territories? You know, uh, I've heard people say, well, you can't be sovereign because you don't have a standing army. Really? That's, that's the requirement? No, it isn't the requirement. I've heard people say, well, you aren't sovereign because you don't have a, um, a, a criminal, criminal jurisdiction. You don't, you don't have criminal courts. We didn't have them before white people showed up here. So I think there has to be a new way of thinking that brings, again, brings from our past to our present and to the future. We, we've got to go forward with a different way of viewing our existence. It took a huge change in the way we viewed ourselves to get out of living up to the high the hollywood image that was created for us to owning who we are as distinct people understanding what the circle wampum was understanding the idea that that we are all equal that no man is higher or woman is higher than the other this idea of eliminating hierarchies we had lost all that look there were a period of time that we were adopting somebody else's image of what a chief was higher than the rest of us I've listened to translations of the Diana de Goa that talked about the, the Confederacy lords. Lords. I've heard people refer to the Taladajo as the Grand Chief. That's all old language. We don't talk about that that, that that way anymore. And look, we've also tempered the enthusiasm for, for, the, for the non-native spirituality, the church. We tempered the enthusiasm towards enlisting in the U.S. military and, and the Canadian military machine. I'm not saying there aren't still people doing it, but not with the enthusiasm that, that there was before. So I think we, we've seen the effects. We've seen the effects of, of reclaiming our identity and re reclaiming our distinction. But as I said, we, we owe, we owe some, uh, some of the people that came before us for that because we didn't wake up you know, come out of the womb knowing what we know today without people before us that, that, that laid that groundwork. But I'll tell you, we, we, there was a generation, you know, right in that, in that decade of the 70s, there was a generation that took a, to a completely different view about where we were going to go with our future. We lost some of those people along the way. Not only did we lose them because of death and, and, and because of age, but we also lost a few people because of fear. And this idea that we would actually fight for who we were, it scared off some people. We lost some people to the other side. Some people advocated against us. The, the sovereignty movement, the warrior movement became attacked even from native people. And we're, and we're still withstanding some of that. But in the meantime, every point of resistance, whether it's for a pipeline, a rail line, you know, a, uh, a, you know an encroachment on our territory, has more and more people, more and more young people. So again, I'm encouraged with where we're going forward, but I just want to remind people, you know, wh where our current existence comes from. Because yes, it comes from long, long, long time ago, but it, but it got maintained eh, not so long ago. It was never the plan that we would still be here. And nobody ever thought that Native people would still be here in the 21st century. And the fact that we are here, still distinct, still autonomous in the 21st century, we owe some of it to a long time ago, but we, all, we also owe some of it to only to a mere 50 years ago. So, Yahweh to those who, uh, who helped us get here, and Yahweh to those of you who help us go forward. I want to thank you for listening to the program. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native.